Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, we are back with our third installment of Office Hours with Lisa Wang, which is a bi-weekly series of Ask Me Anything style virtual office hours. These sessions are co-hosted by Alice, which is a free website helping business owners start and grow their company, and Woman Made, which is a PepsiCo initiative to support female founders with peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and access to tools, relevant content, and expert guidance. For support in your business and to access the recording after this session, please join the free woman made community on helloalice.com. Uh, Lisa Wang, our host for these office hours, is the founder of SheWorks, the leading global platform empowering 20,000 women to build and scale successful companies. And this week, Lisa is joined by Marina Haji Pateras, sorry, pardon me, um, who is the co founder and general partner at Trail Mix Ventures. And they will be discussing the topic of how to successfully navigate your investor meeting. So at any time during the discussion, please feel free to drop in your questions using the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Lisa, would you like to take us away? Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to today's live female founder office hours. So my name is Lisa Wang. I'm the founder of SheWorks, and I'm really excited to have everyone here with us today for another installment as part of the community at Woman Made. And um, as was mentioned, we are here today with Marina Hajpateras. She's the partner of Trail Mix Ventures. We'll be talking about how to successfully navigate your investor meeting. And this is always an interesting topic for me because there are so many nuances and the reality is that different investors will have different answers to some of these questions. So Marina and I will do our best to share our insights around your questions today. So just for those of you who are here, if you find the chat box at the bottom of your screen, I just wanna know who's excited for today, where are people tuning in from, uh, what city are you? So take a minute to just type in the chat and we'll shout some people out so we can see where you're tuning in from. Got Candace from NYC. Hey, Candace. Ashley from Washington, D.C. Denver. Anna from San Francisco. Karen from Harlem, New York. Luann from Buffalo. And from Dubai, Nick. We've got Abby from Houston. Rebecca from Minneapolis. Simone from Aurora, Chicago, Casey from Hawthorne, Nancy from Minneapolis, Matana from Brooklyn, Leticia, D.C., Rashawn, Charlotte, Heya from Krakow, Pol Poland, Navit, um, Kwanya from Florida, Leighton, Saratoga, California. Hey, Jan. Jan was part of the fundraising boot camp. Jan, it's great to see you. Elaine from New York City, Houston, New York, Jane from Scotland, Carmen from Chicago, and Lisa from D.C. So awesome. We have people from all over the place, which is really exciting again. And this is really why we have these virtual office hours to give all of you access to um, the knowledge that investors like Marina have no matter where you are in the world. So before we get started, I wanna say a quick thank you to PepsiCo for making these office hours possible and Alice for hosting us. This is going to be an engaging and informative hour. So um, as you hear interesting quotes or valuable nuggets of information, I encourage you to write it down engage with us on social. Um, for those of you who want to get even more engaged, um, type in your questions and we will get to those in the second half of the session. So um, without further ado, today we are joined by Marina and Marina Hajpateras is a co-founding partner at Trail Mix Ventures. Prior to founding the firm, she was a VP of Investor Relations for Dorian LPG. Um, she was a key figure in taking her family's 200-year-old shipping company public in 2014. And she restructured Dorian and oversaw talent, PR, IR, and accepted the Tanker Company of the Year Award. And she's a board member currently of the North American Marine EPA. So Marina, I'm really excited to have you here. And I would love for you to just kick it off and tell us a bit about your investment thesis and what gets you excited about the founders that you ultimately invest in. Definitely, and thank you so much, um, Lisa and, and Sandra and Alice, and for having me as well. It's great to, to be here and be speaking to you and to have everybody from all over the world, literally. So um, I'm really excited to, to be here um, for the next hour. Um, I, I mean, Trail Mix Ventures is, is an early stage pre-seed seed and Series A fund. Um, we um, focus on the wellness and what we call the care economy, which um, is really caring for the environment, for your mind, for your body, for your elders, for your children, anything that has to do with um, 
living a, a more fulfilling, a better life, um, and uh, in terms of in your wellness and, um, and care. And then the future of work, which is also encompassing in the care economy. So I'd say health and wellness, and on a broader scope, um, all forms of care. Um, I could fit all of our 23 portfolio companies from Fund One uh, into those categories, and, uh, and we're about to start um, focusing on Fund Two which uh, is a larger fund, but with the same thesis. Great. Can you tell us about some of the companies that you've invested in, perhaps some brands that uh, the, the group might know of and how they made a great first impression on you? Sure, so um, I, I can start with Henry the Dentist, um, which is a mobile dentistry clinic that brings um, your dentist office to you. It's based out in the, um, the suburbs and it's really, taking care of yourself and also the future of work. It has those two components in it. We found the founder, Justin, at a Harvard Business School pitch, an alumni pitch that we went to to look for amazing founders um, and to, to share um, deal flow with, with other VCs. And he was pitching and we, um, we wanted to take a meeting with him. We asked him for a meeting. We ended up leading his pre-seed round. So we went in before anyone else and we brought in um, the, the, the VC that ended up leading his next round. Um, and then we brought in Forerunner and Kristen Green um, to lead his Series A. Uh, and now um, he's expanded to four cities, has 11 mobile clinics, um, and is doing really well. Um, that's an example of how we like to be helpful in terms of um, actually introducing other VCs once we start investing um, with our founders and also helping um, in, uh, founders with their pitch deck. I'd also say the wing is an obvious one. I mean, they're they're kind of killing it. We met them two and a half years ago um, and two awesome women founders. They focus on the future of work to us and also care because their community spaces um, embody safe spaces, empowerment for women. And, um, and so those are two examples, I think, of, of founders that we met um, and had a great impression on, on us. Uh, when, we, when we met the wing, we, um, we decided to invest on the spot because it was um, it was just within our thesis and we and we the founders sort of blew us away so those are two examples but there there are different stories for every founder and like you said every every meeting is different even for us um, it depends on the market space and and where the founder is and on their journey and how how we can help them I want to dig in on the thing that you just said that they blew you away and you invested on the spot can you go a little bit deeper into what it is that they did in their pitch that blew you away? Was it the tone? Was it the proposition? What was, was it the future projections? Um, it was, it was the, um, the white space that was there for them to fill up and it was their, um, their grit that we knew that they would encounter no's and tough times, but that they um, would get through them. Uh, and, and we just, and also, we knew that it was something that we would use. I mean, not all of the products uh, that we invest in and the companies that we invest in, we can fully, you know, use or relate to. Um, just because that's uh, that's a different type of scope. But um, but for that, it was just something. I mean, it was it was pending diligence. So we have to be um, for our, for our LPs, obviously. Like we we um, we had to make sure we took that into account, but it was, they blew us away um, in terms of who they were. We go in at such an early stage that the founders really are um, so who we focus on and the way they think um, towards projections to either product market fit or um, profitability. So if you had to give some advice to some of the founders here on how to make a great first impression, um, you know, especially if you're pre-revenue, what would you suggest? I would say um, if you're walking into a meeting or if you're sending that email, um, you know, know your numbers, um, know your milestones to get to the next three months or six months of, for the money that you're, you're looking for or you're asking for. Know your differentiation, what makes you different um, as a product or um, as a concept, and then as a founder. Know why you're pitching that specific investor and even that specific person who is part of that fund, how can they use their experience to help you? Uh, which is ultimately what, what we'd like to do. Um, 
and um, I'd say, yeah, just focus on, also know your weaknesses. I think um, as long as you know your strengths, but also your weaknesses and how you can solve for that, that shows vulnerability, but in a good way. Um, and all, you know, and, and it shows that you're, you're not just sort of just saying everything is great and I know what I'm doing and this is the best product. You're saying this is, I believe fully in this company that I'm starting. I have a good team or I am my team and I can hire, I, I know I've pinpointed one or two people who are, um, who I'd like to bring onto this team. It doesn't have, they don't have to be specific people, but the types of people. Um, I know numbers. I know what I want to get to within the next three to six months. This is how I'm going to use the money. Um, and this is why I'd like to work with you. And that's really it. I mean, it does, it, you know, it's, and then we, we go on to the next meeting and it shouldn't, it shouldn't um, be too long of a process in terms of taking a few months. It, you and the investor will need to, to gel and then you decide if you want to work together. So there are two interesting points in there that I want to talk about. One was when you were talking about the, um, the question of why the specific investor and how they can help you, which is really touching on the value add beyond the capital, because I think that there's a lot of founders who are only seeing the investor as a dollar sign. And what you pointed out is just something really important to remember is like actually doing as a founder, the due diligence on the investor, right? Like seeing what it is that they can add. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, we have a lot of founders who pitch us, well, one, because of our thesis, but also, I mean, specifically Trail Mix likes to, um, to be helpful in certain ways. So we do speak to the majority of our founders at least once um, a week or once every other week, um, whether they're raising and we can make introductions at the right time and activate our relationships, whether it's a partnership that might be helpful um, beyond a series A round or um, a relationship with another VC firm to carry them over to that next round. Um, my partner has an amazing marketing background. Um, my, I, can, I can show you what a pathway to an exit might be like if it were an IPO um, or how to build a team from my past experience. So we'd love to be helpful if that's something that you were looking for. And one of the things that we do do is after we've spoken to you for the first time is provide a list of, of how we can be helpful if we feel that that next step is necessary and to see if that's something and the relationships that we have that can relate to your company. Um, but I would say that for the investor, oh, sorry, for the founder to, to do that, um, a little bit of research on, on that beforehand, just for, for nowadays, I think a lot of funds do want to be helpful in that way. It just shows a little bit more of how, how we can connect, how we can connect with that investor. Cool. I think we've gotten a couple of comments that's a bit hard to hear you, Marina. Maybe scoot a little closer to the computer? Uh, yeah. Cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak louder. Awesome. Um, so the second point that you touched on is the idea of knowing your weaknesses and actually addressing them. Because I think there's a lot of confusion around, you know, saying that your company is further along than it is, um, showing you have very bold plans, um, confidence, and... How do you balance that with being open with your weaknesses and not having that become a point of um, attack, you know, by the investor who digs so far into your your weakness? Um, I think for for us, you can. There's a difference between being. Um, I mean, I think being bold and being confident and believing in the in your company um, is 100% how you should how you should be and if you're if you're that early on you will have some um some doubts and some in terms of um just feeling like things are going are up and down but an investor should know that and they can identify what your what holes um that you might need to fill and you should we talk we talk through it with um with a founder at that early stage but we can identify and appreciate the your confidence and your passion, because if you're not behind your product, then how can we get behind your product or your company? Um, so that boldness, and I saw in one of the questions, you know, is 12 months versus six months of, of run rate or eight months of run rate. Um, well, let's talk about it. I mean, that's still a good amount of time 
for, for an investment at that early stage. I, I think being bold and being confident um, are, it's, it's necessary because you need to be behind your company and you need to help us believe in your company. Um, and then we'll, we'll get on that journey together. So for us, that's, that's appealing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a question just that come, came up from Brooke and she said, what is white space? And if the same grit was seen in a female founder, would you still be as impressed? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, yes, definitely. Um, we, we actually see a lot, just judging like factually, a lot um, of grit from female founders because um, I think there's a, it's a time now where we're forcefully going out and, um, and you know, not apologizing. Um, we do notice that female founders um, often ask for less and are less confident and are worried about being confident or bold or overstepping. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I encourage you not to be and to, to fully believe in yourself and then some. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so let's, if we move into the, the actual investor meeting, what sorts of questions should you expect to be asked um, when you first get there? Well, I mean, the, the obvious questions, I guess, would be just the terms of, of, what, of your round. And if they aren't set out yet, um, I would just have a basic idea of what you might be asking for. If it's a pre-seed round, it would be somewhere you know, below 500,000, um, around the 300 or 250, or it, it depends. I mean, everything is really different now. And the, term pre-seed and seed can be inter interswitched. But so I would have those numbers just um, put out. I would have where you are. Are you pre-product launch? Are you, are you, have you launched? How many users do you have in terms of what, what type of company you have? Um, I would have those questions. I would have how did, you know, the history of how you came to be. Why are you the right, why, why are you the right person for this? Do you, um, how did you come up with this idea or how did this come come to you. Um, and then, I mean, we even ask things like, um, again, like competitors, differentiation. Um, a lot of founders walk us through their deck and, and, um, and then send us or have us sign up for whatever it is that we're looking at. Um, at that point, for us, we have a second me meeting by introducing them to one more person on the team. Um, and fill out a due diligence checklist. Um, we often ask who your co-investors are. If you don't have co-investors, that's, you know, we've, we've led rounds before, um, but that's just a question to see who's around the table, who are your advisors, and again, what are your strengths and weaknesses? A lot of it, again, at this early stage is to understand the way you think, because we can't see a lot of, um, of traction yet. Traction and product market fit gets you to that series A, but we're here to help you get there. So it's, it's really getting to know you as a founder at this stage and um, in that market space. Got it. And Jan has a question. She says, with a pre-revenue company, do you expect to see estimated, what expect, with a pre-revenue company, do you expect to see estimated projections for 36 months? We expect to see, um, projections at least for 24 months, but we know that they might change, um, you know, with, that things change very um, drastically within the first few months. So yes, we, we, when we take a look at a model or projections, it's more to see how you think versus um, looking at those actual projections. It gives us a look into what you think that market potential is. Yeah. Um. I think that's a good point and something that I emphasize a lot where I think a lot of people get stressed out about their projections and they're saying, how can I talk about numbers that don't even exist? I don't even have revenue. I don't have users. And I think, yeah, it's the reality is it's storytelling, right? It's, it's having the ability to think all the way to the end and like what's the narrative that goes with it because it is the thought process. Exactly. It's, it's the thought process. Um, we look at a model literally to see what, what the founder was, how, how he thought out that, that model or she thought out that model. Yeah. Um, so what materials should you have prepared going to the meeting? 
Um, you know, there's obviously the deck. Is there anything else that you can think of? The deck and if, if it's possible to just bring a sample or to um, maybe send something right before to show someone how to sign up for or download or bring a sample of or just something that would, because we would ask for that afterwards. So it's just taking that extra step to say, hey, I, I this is, look, this is exactly how it works. You could, there'll be a page probably about it in the deck, but that's just something that would take you that step closer to um, the investor getting to know you and, and your company more. But it's really for us, it's, it's the deck. Great. Um, it's a founder. Any best practices in terms of, um, you know, sending it beforehand, uh, having a leave behind deck or anything like that? Um, definitely sending it beforehand um, is, is helpful. Um, I like to look, review everything beforehand so that I have questions that I can ask. So I would say um, to send it beforehand, if you have questions or um, if you have pointers that you want to address, um, put them in the body of an email. So you know, if it's like, I'm looking forward to having this meeting, um, here's the deck and um, just like one or two things like, and this is where we are now, um, or uh, just something that, that the founder could be like, oh, okay, this is, and if, and if it's like very, very early, um, this is why I think that, this is why I'd like to speak to you. Um, I, I had something come in the mail the other day from a founder that we hadn't, um, we hadn't spoken to yet and I hadn't heard from in any other, other form but that and it was a box with a handwritten letter inside um, with a list of why Trail Mix um, and that founder and his product fit with us and so that was that was a, a good way of kind of <laughs> but that's sort of I mean that's that's the first time that happened so. Did you invest? <laughs> Um, it was, yes, it was, uh, it was yeah, um, a few days ago, but we haven't, we're, it's in the pipeline, but we haven't invested. Okay. Um, what's a, uh, Orion has a question and says, what's a great way to position MVP results when you're a pre-revenue uh, business on a consumer product? Um, I would say, I think that the best way to do that is just to really speak to, um, speak to potential or, um, or anything that kind of, I would just sort of straight out kind of say where you are and, um, and then the potential of what you think. Again, it's, it's, it's one of those things where um, an, an investor at this stage should know um, that there's, there's that potential for product market fit. And um, if you're pre-revenue and that's a stage that you're at, then, um, I would just position it in, in sort of a future look, outlook, but also just where you are right now. And on a similar question, we also got a question from Layden. She says, also in terms of pre-product, um, but as a software, as a service business, what's the best way to present it? Um, so pre-product and a software as a service. I mean, again, it's it's, competitors in the market space or ones that are coming up, it's um, projections of, of where it could go and why you are the founders. It's, a lot of it is focused on you as a founder at this stage. I mean, that's really, um, I'd say the number one reason why we would invest early on unless you know, a company is, is just later stage but still in, in their seed round um, is because of who you are as that founder and why you can take that mark uh, product to market. Yeah. So. I, and I think that's a really good point because I, you know, with a lot of the questions that come in, um, not just in this session, but overall, um, the, it seems like there's a lot of questions of like, if I do this, is it wrong? And if I do this, is it wrong? And if I do that, is it wrong? And it's, you know, what you keep emphasizing, and I want to point this out, is that at the end of the day, it's about how you tell your story and how you sell your vision, right? because especially when you don't have those numbers, um, the ability to, to um, bring the investor into your narrative, right? And have them really believe it. Like it, it doesn't matter, you know, in some ways, like what you say your 24 month projections are. It's like, as long as they're ambitious, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as they're ambitious and they're aligned with the um, with the fund that you're that you're pitching. Um, and if you've got that meeting already, there's there's a reason why you have that meeting. So I would just be confident and in your company and in yourself and the story that you're telling. Um, it is it is hard, like you said there. It's hard to to have those numbers set and say, look how look how well we're doing. This is why you should invest. It's like, look at me, believe in me, because I can take this company and I can like scale it and fill it. And and that's um, so we have to believe in, in you and not just what you're selling, what you're, you know, what your company is. Yeah. And I think this aligns with Jane's question where she asked, how do you establish yourself as a first time founder? It seems like multi-time founders have a huge advantage here. And I think it, it still goes to your point, right? Yeah. Yeah. And also there, there, one of the questions that we have in our diligence process is how close have you been to success? Um, you don't have to have founded a company before, but if you've been a part or if there's, you've had that taste um, in any sense, um, then you know um, a little bit of you know, how to navigate that. And, and if not, then again, it's about you as that founder and the grit that you, that you need to have to keep going as a founder. Um, because as, as everyone knows, it's, it's, all, it's ups and downs and um, you wake up and you feel like everything's great and then you're like in the middle of the day, you're like, oh my God, what's going to, you know, I, we, we know that that, that happens and we just want to make sure that we're there for you, but that you can also handle that. And grit then primarily you're still looking at like their background. At, at this point. Yeah. We're looking at who they are. It has to also be a relationship that we feel that we can cultivate in terms of just like, um, human to human and personality wise a, a little bit because we're going to be working so closely. So that does factor into it. Um, who you are, the way you think. And, um, and so I think like, and as a founder, you know, your, your experience and your background and what led you to where you are today. Um, I don't think there's a wrong, and you know, it's not as if like, it, it's just, it, it does depend a little on the, on the investor. Um, and then there are follow on investors. So some one investor might say, okay, and then bring a bunch of other people in. But if it's a first, if you don't have anyone in, in your round yet, and you're just coming to me, um, I just, I want to get to know you. I want to believe in you and your, and, and what you're um, telling me about. I mean, we want that. So we're on the same page almost. It's just, it's the storytelling and, um, and the space that we need to understand. Mm -hmm. Great. And question from Kwanya, and she says, suggestions on how to get the meeting in the first place. So I would say um, I definitely warm intros help. So I mean, making networking as, um, as tedious as it can be sometimes is and we, all, we all do it and, it and it does help. And if you meet one person, I would ask for an introduction to another person um, and then ask you know, ask, be direct. Do you know this fund? Because I'd really like to speak to them because I'd like them to invest. So I'd say networking in that sense. Um, cold emails. I, we look at all of our emails. It's with, there's a lot of inbound and I, and it's hard to, um, for everybody to kind of get to everything, but like, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly in cold emails and we do, um, like I said, with the, the package in the mail or emails that come through, I try to write everyone back. And if it looks like something we would invest in, then I, I set up a meeting. Um, but I'd say um, through networking um, and, and just ask, don't be afraid to ask someone for something. It can be, it can be you know, just an introduction or one thing or, or even ask a cold email and ask that person for something. Or, um, I think it's, it's a small network and everyone's trying to, to be successful. So, <laughs> so it's... Yeah, I like to advocate something called the full responsibility pledge, which is that wherever you are in your life, financially, emotionally, physically, that you have to take full responsibility for that. Yeah. And I think that this is also part of it where a lot of people ask that question as well. And it's like, how do I meet people? Well, you meet people by going out and meeting them. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's really like taking the responsibility to put yourself in situations where 
uh, there are investors and there's plenty of conferences, there's plenty of meetups, um, you know, there's no shortage of entrepreneurial events. Um, and, you know, even being on something like this and like yeah. have, asking, right, that you're already doing the right thing. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's like, how do we find people? We, we go to pitch competitions, we go to um, different um, networking events, like you said, we go to conferences, we, we have weekly calls with, uh, we used to have, we had a Monday weekly call that we started eight months ago with four um, other VCs. It's turned into 40 um, women VCs at the moment, and we'll have men come in too. But it's, but everybody wants to share who they're speaking to. So, you know, we're, we're all, we're looking for companies the same way. And so I think those are the best ways to do it. Great. Uh, we have a few questions about the financial part of the raise, which is, um, Jan says, in a pre-revenue ask, how long of a runway should you ask for? For instance, uh, nine months versus 15 months. So I think that's a runway question. Okay. So if you're pre-revenue and then you're, um, and you're raising and you're raising a certain amount in order to get to um, a certain amount of MRR or ARR, how long should you ask for? Um, I would say um, if you're going in and raising a pre-seed round and you're pre-revenue, um, should I say, you know, eight, eight to eight to 12 months, because um, for a seed round, we're looking at an MRR. We look for MRRs of about 10,000. And then uh, for a series A, you know, you're looking for a 1 million or above ARR. Um, so set those milestones, but give yourself some time and, and make sure that you know, again, what you're using the, the, the money for, because every dollar in is a dollar out as well. Great. Um, so I, I, I want to reiterate some of the, the milestones that you had said, which was that, because um, essentially there's pre-seed, there's seed, and there's series A, and that, you know, pre-seed is really your pre-revenue, right? You have the idea, you're betting on the founder. Um, by the time you're raising your seed, the ability to show traction that you have um, 10K in MRR, that's monthly recurring revenue, and if by the time you're going out to raise your Series A, you should already have a million in a annual recurring revenue. That's that's what um, what we look for. Great. Um, when it comes to uh, your current revenue, Amber asks, do you show your current revenue in your deck? And then Jan asks, do you expect a founder to include a salary for themselves in the raise? Um, in terms of revenue um we we will ask if if there is revenue so usually i haven't seen it in the deck but it'll be something that comes up and it's um and i would i would speak to it um we'll or it'll come up in the model but to be honest i, I don't see it in the deck very often um but uh but it's something to speak to in that meeting um in terms of the salary if it's if it's uh, pre-seed, um, right, is it so? Is the question should I pay myself or is it should I include a salary? Or, Are they different? <laughs> or a potential salary, um, but I think I think it um, it like depending on the raise and the funds and if that salary is something. Um, if it's, and we hope that it's a full time, you know, that you're working full time on, on, on this, um, it depending on like the partnership that you might have. Um, yeah, if, if you're going to include it, I would, I would definitely include it. Yeah. I mean, you have to pay yourself. It just, you know, inflated salaries might, might, um, trigger something because you also want to get your product to a certain space so that you can make more money in order to pay yourself that salary. So it's that little bit of like, you know, working to get your product there, but yeah, you have to pay yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you take a step back and think of the holistic picture, um, like the, the, the question of should you even pay yourself is, it's kind of a crazy one, right? Like you have to live, you have to be able to, 
eat so you can build your company. And I think a lot of these things, it's like taking a step back and thinking, you know, this is not about the investor. This is about building a successful company. And the investor is a, a teammate in doing so. But if you can't feed yourself and you can't live, like everyone loses. Exactly. And, and you know, I say that full time part. And I also understand that until you get, to, we also understand until you get to a certain stage, you need to live. So, I mean, every person and every um, company is different. And that's the point of getting into that first meeting. But yeah, include a salary if, um, and, and talk to the investor about that. If as an investor, we should push back if there's anything that we feel um, that we want to have a question about. And um, so, and I, and I don't want it, we don't want it to be a scary meeting, but, um, but I understand you want to know how to get that first meeting and how to be in that first meeting and have it be a successful one. So. Yeah. Uh, a question from Casey and she says, if a founder is non-technical, what makes them overall stand out that makes you still want to invest in them? For example, if the company is an app. Oh, um, passion. I mean, you can, we can, we see fire in these founders who like will go all the way and just, you can see it in their eyes. I mean, it, it is again, like, because it's early, like, and I've, and it's not just us, like you can, if, if you have a passion for your company and you really believe in it um, and, uh, and there's a reason why, you know, we're having that meeting. Um, if you're not technical, that's fine. Whatever your strong suit is, just focus on that, you know, marketing, whatever it is, focus on that. Again, if you know your weaknesses and how you can solve for them, that's okay. That's, that works then. Yeah, great. Um, and on the, the idea of, you actually touched on marketing. So Xandra wants to know what company marketing materials would you recommend for the founder to present? Oh, um, really just in the first meeting, it's, a, it's the, it's the deck and then anything that you can bring a sample, a sample of. Um, and uh, in a, many, many of our first meetings, there isn't a sample available, but I'm only saying that because it jumps over a step that, you know, that would take a little time. Yeah, yeah, I think that if you have anything, like if you have a demo, obviously if you have an, a physical product, like have the physical product, um, so it's, it, yeah, I think some of it is just, it's like common sense, right? It's like you create, have your deck and then you have the thing that you're actually selling to the investor. Exactly. exactly. And then yourself. And um, so it's just, yeah, having that, that confidence in your, what you're doing. Yeah. Ashley wants to know, are there any implicit biases you see female founders regularly confronting when raising? And do you have any insights for women, especially when talking to more male dominated investors? Um, I think the biases that, um, well, so we're, we're very like focused on not, you know, on, on the opposite of that. So, um, and we've heard stories from female, um, founders. Um, so I think they might be the, the regular ones where it's just that, um, people haven't focused on women as much and they've just invested in, in men, but I think it's, it's changing. There are, there are, a group of women VCs now, which is, and it's getting larger and larger. Um, in terms of advice I would give, um, to be honest, it would be like, it would be confidence. Um, because that's the, uh, if you have the same product as a, as, um, as a male founder, the only thing that we've noticed specifically is that women ask for less. They don't think they deserve what the, what the male is asking for. Um, and then, and, and that's, I think that's the issue more. It's, it's that confidence. Yeah. And you can choose, like, sometimes you don't want someone, um, in certain instances, money, money is, is great, but protect yourself as well. Um, you can, you can find a, a lawyer pre paying them and offer them, something, if they're a really good lawyer, and I have some um, people I could introduce you to, they, you know, they're not going to take a lot from you, but you can offer them something and they can protect you because don't take, don't take money for a huge percentage of your business. 
there, are, there is money out there. It's just, I mean, that's why we're having this conversation to navigate and to find that money. Yeah. What's a, what would you say is a good percentage to expect to give up in the pre-seed and then the seed and the series A? Um, I'd say in a, it really depends on like on the raise, I would say. Um, I'm, I'm wary of saying um, like a specific percentage because I, I, I mean, we're, we're kind of fighting for you not to get diluted. So we don't want like anything. I mean, definitely. Um, so I, I, I'd love to follow up with, with that if that, if that works, but I, um, you know, as, as little as possible in the pre-seed, just make sure like, and that's why you don't raise a lot in the pre-seed so that you don't get diluted straight away and you're motivated to keep going. Um, and we, you know, I, I'd love to, I can follow up with something there too. Great. Um, go, skipping back to the investor meeting itself, um, we had a question that came in earlier from Laura Stewart, and she had said, um, it, it seems like how much, it seems like she's gone into some of these meetings where she wanted to hit on certain points, but the investor moves mm -hmm. them towards a different direction. So she says, how much structure should we provide if dealing with an investor who says, I'll give you 20 minutes and I have my own set of questions, but those questions don't actually speak to the important things that she as a founder would want to highlight. I think I, I saw that question. I think the best you can do is um, if that investor has a specific agenda, then, you know, try and address your key points um, during that meeting after the, after they've spoken. If you can't do that, the, the best you can do is follow up um, and in the body of the email in bold say, you know, these points were ones that I didn't get to address and I'd like to, and, um, and that's the best you can do. Um, but, um, but I would try to take, I wouldn't be worried about trying to take a little bit of control because they're there to learn about you. And, um, and if there's something that you feel that is important to speak to, um, just try to take a, a bit of control there, but otherwise follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see. We have a, a lot, a few more questions that we are going to try and get to. Uh, how would you recommend a company to pitch their competitive differences if they have a larger company as a competitor, for example, a Google or an Apple, um, in a way that doesn't scare the investor but shows that you're confident in your product? That's a question from Rahima. Um, I would just say, how, how are you going to scale? So, so in terms of the competitive differences, talk about your growth and how. Um, because sometimes those competitors can actually acquire you um, and that's your pathway to exit. So it's not necessarily like you're, unless, unless it depends what your, um, what your exit strategy is, but I would just talk about your growth and how you can take over that market. And then you could even talk about your exit strategy. It shows the way you're thinking. And if you're pitching to a venture capitalist, um, then you have to be venture friendly and know that at some point there is, you know, an exit strategy, whether it's an acquisition or an IPO or. Great. Um, do you have any tips on how to set up the market opportunity to get investors excited? Does everything have to be a 20 billion plus market? That's a question from Orion. Um, not everything has to be a 20 billion plus market. Um, I would, I would, I wouldn't um, downplay how big the market opportunity is. Um, and, um, but, uh, so, I mean, I, I would just be, I would, I would just put the numbers out there. And um, I've, we had a few founders say to us, you know, this is a couple hundred million opportunity, uh, dollar opportunity. In reality, it actually was a billion dollar opportunity because most things, a lot of things can be. Um, but um, but we know some companies that uh, that will be acquired at a lower rate and they're incredibly successful. Um, so I would just say, just again, like be confident and um, um, materialize. Like if just show how you're how how you can scale and how big that market opportunity is. But it does, not everything has to be a fifty billion dollar a unicorn. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Layden has a question. She says, if a startup is patent pending with a trade secret, what's the best way to present the differentiator in my experience since the investors do not offer any protection, it's challenging. 
well, an NDA is, is helpful a little <laughs> bit. Um, I mean, that's just an obvi like an obvious one. Um, and uh, I mean, that's appealing because you want to, because it's, you know, there's, there's something out there which might be proprietary um, to that product. But, um, but I would say the best way is you can speak to it. Um, and if the investor understands the concept enough, then they should um, respect that or sign an NDA. Mm -hmm. And how often do you get NDAs? Is that common practice or do you think differently about them? We, we, we hardly ever get NDAs, to be honest. Um, so I haven't been in that instance before, um, but, um, uh, but so yeah, we don't, we don't get NDAs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's um, echoing what most investors say, which is that if you're if you're going to be pitching your company, get them to invest. Like, it it in some ways, I've had investors who said that it actually looks amateur when someone sends an NDA because it's it's actually not as much about the idea as it is about the execution. So yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's true, I guess, but it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with signing an NDA if you're worried about a patent pending kind of something that you don't want to um, to, to be known. Yeah. Um, so we have another question from Catherine, and she had said um, in her company, in her investor meeting, she talked boldly about what she wanted to do, but she worries that she was too bold and money is tight and is not the 12 month runway. I said it was, it was actually six to nine months. Um, was she too bold? <laughs> no, the, I, I read that question. I, she, I don't think she was too bold. That's one of the questions that, you know, I, I have heard that before and, um, and it's okay that, I mean, we, if, if that investor is going to invest, I would hope they would invest sooner than that, than that six months and help you work on the, um, getting a longer run rate. Um, and I don't think being bold or confident um, is, is bad, as long as you can also be vulnerable because you don't wanna be scared to tell your investor that you have two weeks of run rate because that's, that's, that's just not a good relationship. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's bad for everybody. So. Um, be be open because why do you want someone around your table if you can't um, be like fully open with them? I know you want the capital, but at this point there is a different st different um, thing happening where investors are trying to be more helpful. So, um, I, but not too bold. I, I really don't think. And there's a difference between like you can tell if someone's being bold or just like kind of a lot of hot air um, and and. It, you can feel it in a founder and, and I think you might be able to feel it in an investor too. So be bold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's also another theme. Like I think we've had a, a couple big themes today. One is about passion and your narrative and your thought process. And that at the end of the day, it's, there's, you know, there's so many questions that we could be asking about if this is the right thing or this is the wrong thing, but you know, circling it back to, is this the best narrative to bring my vision and my company forward. And the second thing being confidence, confidence and, and boldness in stating what it is that you want to get accomplished, um, but being also open about the, you know, the potential things that could go wrong and how you'd solve for them. Exactly, and I think a strength is actually showing like where your weakness might lie. Like if, if you're not good at the tech part or the finance part, what are you gonna do if about that you still believe fully in your company like and, and what you're selling I mean that doesn't take it away but how, how will you solve for that and that shows that you are a good leader to take to take this all the way and that puts confidence in us um, back to you yeah so to once we get to the end of the investor meeting right let's say you've gone through a, a couple meetings um, what should a founder do to drive urgency to close? Um, I would say that, I mean, just the typical, you know, providing a deadline is helpful in any instance, because um, otherwise you could take your time. Um, getting a, a lot of people, like if there are peop other people around the table, um, just, 
you know, updating the founder. I, I mean, sorry, updating the investor. So sending, sending a, um, a little note either weekly or every, um, every other week saying like, this is where we are. Um, and, um, and, uh, and I think that's the best thing. And, um, that, so we've, we've, we've had that happen. And usually we try to make a decision within, you know, within two weeks to a, to a month, depending on how much time there is. Um, we've had founders pitch us lo much longer ago than that. And we just wanted to stay in touch and hear how they're doing. And then we've invested later. It, ha it, it definitely pays to stay in touch, even if, um, you know, if it doesn't feel like a right fit in the beginning, but I would just set that deadline and, and sense, I think that's the way to do that sense of urgency and update um, the investor. So say, Hey, I, I haven't heard back from you, but this is, this is what's been happening. Um, are you in or are you out? And they're doing you a service by telling you one way or the other, because otherwise you don't want to be waste. You don't want to waste your time. You know? Yeah. There, I, I get a lot of questions from founders often about um, ghosting and when the investor just doesn't respond and then they follow up. Do you have any suggestions about that and how many times you should follow up or when you should give up? Um, I would say if, I, I'd say if you don't hear back from, if you had a, a meeting with an investor and then you follow up with them um, and you don't hear back, I would, I would give it... Um, two tops, three, three more follow-up emails. Um, and then I give it, you know, six months, if in six months you still, you know, you're on your next round. It doesn't mean you're still, you know, or, or something like that. Then I would, I would circle back in. Um, again, because I don't want to, it's, it's not, then it's not worth your time. I don't want you to waste your time. You've got a lot going on already. So, but I would definitely follow up definitely more than once if you don't hear back, because sometimes it's just a crazy time for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there in, oh, so we have another question about dollar amount of MMR, MRR for attracting pre-seed, but I think we talked about that already where you don't necessarily need revenue for pre-seed, right? Yeah, we look for about 10K per, per seed. Per seed, yep. Um, do you invest in companies that compete directly with others in your portfolio? Have you invested in a new company similar to a previous investment that has failed? Um, that's a question from Navit. Okay. Uh, we do not invest with companies that are competitive with, um, with ones in our portfolio, unless there's an answer um, as to how it is, how it differentiates. But we've had uh, quite a few companies pitch us that are similar to Parsley Health or similar to the wing. And we don't invest, um, just because it's a conflict of interest. Um, in terms of ones that have failed, we've had one fold out of the 23 and have not invested in a similar one to that, but would, because to us, um, it, yeah, if, if a founder came to us and they, again, blew us away and, and it looked right, we would definitely invest in one, even if another one had folded. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, looks like we could probably do a couple more questions. Um, let's see. Orion wants to know, I'm raising 350K in pre-seed via convertible note. My thought is this insulates the company from over diluting the shares, but also de-risks the investment by using a debt instrument. Do investors think this way or are there any red flags? No, that makes, we've, um, that's, that's normal for us and, and it makes sense. And I, I like the way you're, you know, I like your thought process there, so. Great. Um, Jan wants to know, is there an average number for a pre-seed round for pre-revenue companies? Usually the raise is around 250 to, you know, 350 or so in, in terms of a pre-seed. Great. But it does, it does vary. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I, I think that another point that I want to make about what we, like the questions that we're getting is that you know, there's a lot of times, this is like what I said at the top of the hour, there's not really clear cut black and white answers to a lot of these things, right? And I think at the end of the day, it's like when you take a step back, it's what is best for your company. If you need 350K to get you to the eight month mark and you've done your projections correctly, that's what you should raise. If you need 500K, then that's what you should raise. And it's like, again, so long as you have that story of why it makes sense for your 
company and your your trajectory then that's what you do yeah yeah exactly and and when we start um speaking to you we don't want to introduce you to vcs for a future round unless you're ready um just like you know so so um we just it yeah it's, it's really telling that story um and getting you through those milestones yeah um and then candace just wants to know do you invest in any service-based businesses uh she's building a personal growth company yeah we do we would we look at um definitely look at service-based businesses great um all right so we are at the we've got just about a minute left um so i wanted to just say a thank you to you marina and if you had to summarize the you know today's talk and just pull out you know one or two takeaways for everyone to keep in their pocket going forward what would you say that would be um definitely you know confidence and don't be afraid to you know talk about how amazing you are and how amazing what you're building is and where it can go. Um, don't, don't apologize. Um, I would say it's just one, it's hard. I grew up in England, so I, it's like it's my nature to apologize every second. But, um, and, and I'd say, again, it's focusing on that story and, and you as a founder and, um, and know what you don't know um, and, and be confident in what you do know. Awesome. Great. So I think that's a really great takeaway and a great way to end this session. Um, so I think we'll bring on team Alice again. Um, so for those of you who do want to engage, um, you can find us on social media. So I'm at Lisa Wang wins, uh, Marina, what's your, the best handle or social to get in oh, touch yeah. with you? Um, I'm at, um, Marina Nicola Hadji. And Alice is at Hello Alice on Twitter. Hello Alice, great. And then Marina, how do you spell yours? Uh, so it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, or you can type it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll type it in for you. Um, yeah, and we can. We'll post this all in the Women Made community as well, which uh, we put a link to in the chat there. Great. And I see some uh, Q and A's about like Andy Swim. I'm happy to answer any any other questions that come through afterwards too. Thank Great. you so much, Marina. And um, we'll help facilitate that. Um, if you guys want to post them in the Women Made community, um, that would be perfect. And we can pass those along to Marina and get some answers for you. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Marina and Lisa, so much for your time. This was so insightful and just a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.